Hey guys, my name is Aldas and in today's video I'm going to be continuing my rise and fall of Ferrari with part 3. Now, first of all, once again guys, I do apologise just like I did in part 2. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of a recurring theme. These episodes all just seem to come out so late one after the other. I think it's been like a month since I recorded the previous one. So yeah, just massive apology guys. And I promise the next episodes will be out much sooner. Yeah, so I can only apologise. I'm really sorry guys, but I am going to complete this series 100%. It will not take me uh, any longer than a couple of weeks uh, to get the rest of them out, I promise. But anyway, guys, now if you did not check out part one or part two, then go check them out. I'll probably link them in the top right or in the description or somewhere there. I've got a playlist, so yeah, definitely go check those out if you haven't already. Now, guys, if you do enjoy the content on this channel and want to support the channel, don't forget to drop a like and smash that subscribe button. And also, don't forget to check out my social medias. Instagram and Twitter will be above. But yeah, guys, let's get in to the rise and fall of Ferrari in Formula One. Part 3. So in the 1980s, the new decade marked a disastrous fall from grace for Ferrari. Just the season before, Ferrari had won the title with Jody Schechter, with his teammate Gilles Villeneuve finishing second in the championship, and they would go on to win the constructors as well, completing the double. But the 80s and 90s would be dire for Ferrari as the next time they would win a driver's championship would be at the start of the next millennium, 21 years later. Now, in the 1980 season, Ferrari only managed to score 8 points the entire year, which gave them 10th place in the Constructors. Now, that is the lowest in Ferrari's history, and that's quite incredible because, you know, granted, the point scoring system was different back then, as only the top 6 finishers would score points, but regardless, it was a failure of a season. Even in terms of the Drivers' Championship, their highest place finisher was 8th, courtesy of Gilles Villeneuve. Now, once again, this is truly stunning to even try to comprehend how a team like Ferrari, in the space of just one year, can go from winning both the drivers' and the constructors' titles to finishing 10th in the constructors' championship and only scoring 8 points with both its drivers. Now, it's hard to pinpoint the one single factor that made that season so bad for Ferrari, but simply with the emergence of the British teams of Williams, Brabham and later on McLaren as well, Ferrari, in terms of car development, had just begun to fall behind, and quite honestly, not for the first time either. Now, the end of the 1980 season would also see the 1979 Ferrari World Champion Jody Schechter retire from Formula 1, and for the 1981 season, Ferrari would go on to sign Didier Peroni to partner Gilles Villeneuve. Now, the 1981 season would show a massive improvement for Ferrari as they would finally abandon their aging 3000cc naturally aspirated engine for a more modern design with a 1.5 litre turbo powertrain. Now, this evolution into the turbo era really put Ferrari back on the map. And despite lots of reliability issues with their newly developed turbo engine and further handling and stability problems, they managed to achieve two wins in the hands of their star driver, Gilles Villeneuve, at Monaco and Spain as well. As well further podiums at the Canadian Grand Prix, which would see Ferrari finish 5th in the Constructors' Championship with Gilles Villeneuve in 7th overall. So Ferrari would once again just seem like they would be destined for glory. Their first year in the turbo era had taught them many lessons and they had now got on top of their aerodynamic instability as well as improving the reliability of their turbo power unit as well. Coupled with that, they had a great lineup with Didier Peroni and the team leader Gilles Villeneuve. So going into the 82 season, Ferrari had everything they needed to win the title from a star driver to a great car that arguably was the best on the grid. However, the 1982 season would be a horror story for Ferrari as they would lose both drivers with the death of Gilles Villeneuve and a career-ending crash for Didier Peroni. Now, on the 8th of May in 1982, Gilles Villeneuve died after a crash with Jochen Maas in qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix at Zolder. Now, it was a simple misunderstanding by both the drivers as they tried to avoid each other, but their collision subsequently launched Villeneuve's Ferrari into the air. His car disintegrated and flew 100 meters at over 120 miles an hour. Villeneuve himself was thrown 50 meters away from his car, still strapped to his seat. Despite getting medical help quite quickly, he was pronounced dead later that evening due to a fatal neck fracture. Now, Villeneuve himself was a very special driver. There is absolutely no denying that. And when talking about the greatest drivers in Formula 1 ever, his name certainly ranks amongst the very best. Many people from Formula 1 drivers like 1979 world champion Jody Schechter to Jeremy Clarkson called him the greatest of them all. 
Now sadly, later on that season at the German Grand Prix, Didier Peroni, who was leading the championship, also had a crash with Renault's Alain Prost. In a crash very similar to Villeneuve's, Peroni survived but suffered multiple fractures in his legs. It would take him almost a year for him to recover, but he would never race in Formula 1 again. Now, despite Peroni leading the championship, eventually with him missing the final four races, it would be Keki Rosberg who would win and take the 1982 World Drivers' Championship. But with Ferrari's early consistency and the replacing drivers of Mario Andretti and Patrick Tambay also doing a solid job, they did win the Constructors' title that year. Now the following year, Ferrari managed to repeat what they had achieved by securing the Constructors title, but once again missed out on the Drivers title with the French pairing of Patrick Tambay and Rennie Arnoux. Now the next year's for Ferrari would also be ones to forget. Despite still being, for the most part, relatively at the top of the field, they couldn't keep up as McLaren had now begun to dominate Formula 1 with arguably one of the greatest driver lineups of all time with Alain Prost and Nicky Lauda. Now, for Ferrari, it was a combination of constant driver changes, cars that were good but never quite good enough or definitely that could not match the McLarens and the Brabhams of that era, as well as reliability issues like in the case of uh, Mikel Alboreto in 1985 which lost him the championship that saw Ferrari slowly begin to trickle down once again culminating in a winless season for 1986. Now, despite gaining some form and winning the last two races of the 1987 season with Gerhard Berger, the end of the 80s saw little success for the Scuderia and once again, McLaren in the hands of the late great Ayrton Senna and the professor Alain Prost were absolutely unbeatable, producing the most dominant season in Formula 1 history, of course we all know it, the 1988 season. But 1988 would be one of the darkest years in Ferrari's history as the main man who began the company and the race team in the first place, the old man himself, Enzo Ferrari, would die at the age of 90 on the 14th of August 1988. Now the race following his death was the Italian Grand Prix and quite fittingly, it was actually the only race that season that McLaren didn't win as Gerhard Berger took a 1-2 for the prancing horse at their home race in front of their Tifosi dedicating his win to Enzo Ferrari. Now, 1989 would be a significant year for Formula 1 with the end of the crazy turbocharged 80s. V12s would return to Ferrari and they were actually one of the biggest forces for this change. But it was actually still a bit of a toss of a coin if these changes were going to happen. And Ferrari, of course, wanted these changes to happen. So to make sure that they did, what do you think Ferrari did in their classic Ferrari style? Well, in classic Ferrari style, they played the political game by creating a Ferrari IndyCar, the Ferrari 637, as a means to show that if Ferrari were not happy, they would leave Formula 1. I mean, wow, Ferrari threatening to leave F1 because they're not happy. Absolute shocker. How many times have we heard that one before now? <laughs> But anyway, regardless of Ferrari threatening to quit for the 600th time in their history, the season would be plagued with reliability issues despite Nigel Mansell joining the team as McLaren would once again go on to win the title with Alain Prost. Now going into the 90s, Ferrari now hadn't won a Drivers' Championship for 10 years and now recruited three-time world champion Alain Prost to join Nigel Mansell. However, this would be far from a dream lineup as the next couple of years would show just how poor the driver and management relationship really was. Now, Prost certified himself as the team leader at Ferrari, much to the anger of Nigel Mansell, who definitely is not a man that you want to get on the wrong side of. There was clear favouritism, even to the point where Mansell said that Ferrari swapped his car with Prost's for the British Grand Prix without his knowledge beforehand. Mansell was understandably angry at how he was treated at Ferrari and left the team at the end of the season with Prost finishing second in the championship after controversially colliding with Senna at the 1990 Japanese Grand Prix. So with Mansell out, it was now the turn of Alan Prost. For the next season in 1991, he was fired by Ferrari before the season had even ended due to harsh criticism that Prost had laid out on that year's car, saying it was harder to drive than a truck. Now, it was a winless year for Ferrari as they struggled to third in the championship. 
So let's just recap of what happened in only a few years time. Ferrari's management of drivers was ridiculous. In two years time, they had in some way or another kicked out two legendary drivers with a combined five world titles and had once again fell behind McLaren and Williams with their aging V12 cars as the other teams found success with lighter and more modern V10s. Now Ferrari had begun to spiral out of control and wouldn't win a single race between 1991 and 1993. However, things did partially come back on track with Jean Todd brought onto the team as team principal for 1993 to steady the ship. The team in the hands of Jean Alesi and Gerhard Berger eventually began to win again, but only with single victories in 1994 at the German Grand Prix and again a single win at the 1995 Canadian Grand Prix. So during the early 90s, something was wrong. Something wasn't working for Ferrari. This team was designed to win, but something wasn't right. The cars were inconsistent season to season and the drivers either weren't quite good enough or were butting heads with the management. And for big problems, you need big solutions. And for the 1995 season, we would see the introduction of a man who would become the most successful driver of all time and a group of people that would not only change Ferrari, but Formula One history itself and Ferrari would begin to rise once again. So guys, there you go. That is the end of part three. Now, part four will be entirely dedicated to, yes, you guessed it, the one and only Michael Schumacher and the combination of Jean Todd, Rory Byrne and Ross Braun as well. I feel like when talking about Ferrari, I mean Michael Schumacher and that combination and what he did just deserves its own episode. So yeah, that'll be for the next part. Now anyway guys, I really do hope you've enjoyed this episode and if you did, then don't forget to drop a like and smash that subscribe button. And also don't forget to check out my social medias, Instagram and Twitter will be above. And also guys, don't forget to comment in the box below of what you thought of Ferrari in this sort of 80s and early 90s era as well. Anyway guys, I will see you in the next episode. Bye guys.